No vacancy. Live time. We got Craig Sullivan over there and a mystery man. Oh, no longer a mystery. Mystery again. Oh my God. Stay tuned. Let's see what happens. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey everyone, I am Glenn Hausman, of course, and it is January 26, 2022, otherwise known as Last Alice Day. Joining us today on the show, we've got Craig Sullivan, California Lodging Investment Conference co-host of Friday Night Audit, and the incredible Bruce Ford, SVP of Lodging Econometrics. Anthony uh, is on a plane, so we're sorry he can't be here today. Hopefully you will stay along, because I would say one Anthony cannot compare to one Bruce and one Craig. Gentlemen! <laughs> So great to see you. And I should say we're broadcasting here from the Wayfarer Hotel in downtown L.A. Just a few minutes walk from the uh, Big Alice Conference. Guys, how are you today? Great. How are you? Doing pretty good. Bruce, what's going on, bro? Can you guys see my tan? You yes. know, it is California. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. So before we get into talking about what's going on in the hospitality market, I did want to let everybody know tonight at 8 p.m. East Coast time, 5 p.m. California time. We're going to be in the basement, uh, Speakeasy Lounge here uh, called Lily something. What's Lily it called? Rose. Lily Rose down there. That's Lily Rose. If you can see her in the picture over there. A lot of tattoos on that lady. If you want to learn more about that, tune in tonight, Friday night on. Of course, uh, Craig and I are going to be joined by Bruce Ford over here as well as it looks like the incredible Sarah Danishi, producer Dave, and maybe even producer Suzanne if we're lucky, hold on, let's find out. Are we going to be so lucky, Suzanne? You are going to be lucky. I've got to oh, knock oh, things oh. down a little. I, sound effects. I can't. Oh, I, oh sound effects. Yeah. All right, so Anthony's on a plane, everybody. So I can do all the sound effects I'd like. Yeah, that's right. Tune in more of that fun this evening. But guys, we're gathered here today. Uh, Suzanne, we'll put you back in the in, in the back now. We'll see you. We'll see you later. All right. So, guys. Uh, fun couple of days over here. It's great that we're all getting back together. You know, Alice has traditionally been the big kickoff financial conference for the hospitality season, really sets the tone and tenor for what we're going to be feeling for the next few months, at least until we get to that uh, early spring check-in at the Hunter Investment Conference and uh, kickoff to summer, NYU. Let's start with um, the big observations that we're seeing out there. But the first thing, guys, I want to talk about is the attendance issue. And uh, I love Jeff Higley and the entire crew over at Burba, but I'm getting real tired of uh, people complaining about the numbers of people at all of these events these, these days without looking at the quality of the human beings that are coming to the events. What say you, boys? Well, I think the percentage of senior leaders inside of these companies was was pretty good this time. Right. I thought that uh, maybe some of the lower level manager, director people maybe chose not to travel or made a different kind of decision. But these companies are all very busy. But the senior leaders, I think, really supported the Alice event this time. Yeah, Craig? I agree with Bruce. I, th I think it was really more quality over quantity, you know, this year compared to July of last year. Right. And the ease of being able to set up that last minute, you know, get together with somebody. Let's go grab lunch. Right. Let's go have a cup of coffee, whatever. And, you know, they're talking deals. They're talking about Wall Street whiplash and a few other things. But I think it was very productive. But you, you, the issue that you have with counting those people, Glenn, is the higher level senior executives don't typically attend the actual sessions. Right. If they're not speaking. Uh, okay. Wait, wait. Do people actually attend sessions they at do. these conferences? They do. I mean, there were some things that were said, Glenn, that were actually important, more important than things you say. So I, I, I don't know. All right. First of all, <laughs> first of all, uh, hold on. A Shots second. fired. <laughs> he said that. Not uh, I know. All right. All right. So uh, tonight, not on Friday night audit. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that is a good point. People do like going to this. But the problem is with these events are that there's so little time and so much to do that I think a lot of people go and they choose to have either meaningful bump-ins, which is usually my strategy, right. or have uh, set up appointments and all that kind of stuff, which makes it a little bit tough um, to be able to do that, right? Well, I had seven appointments in advance and had three people decide not to come. Right. So, Well, to be um, fair, you had there some of your people had some COVID situations too, right? They did. Yeah. They did. 
So it's uh, it was a little bit of a mixed bag, but I had plenty of run-ins. And I think there were more exhibitors at this show than I've seen in a long time yeah. since they let the exhibit hall go per se. Mm -hmm. That whole hallway uh, in the platinum foyer level was lined with with stands and lots of uh, yep. lots of participators in that. So I think that has a positive impact. But also, you know, in general, people are starting to feel a little bit better as we turn the calendar to 2022. The last six months of 2021, there was a a lot of refinancing. There's yeah. a lot of transactions. The franchise companies felt like they were kind of beginning to get off the mat as there were new agreements. Um, but our signings report for the first quarter or, or for the year end um, is not keeping up with opens. And it hasn't for a couple of quarters. And part of the reason for that is, is that uh, conversions are a little bit more active than new construction. Right. And most new construction projects that are in the pipeline are seeing some extended delays as a result of the variants that have affected the, the really the global financial landscape over the past eight to 10 months now. Yeah. So Bruce, um, uh, you know, you guys put out a big release on January 21st, just prior to this conference, where you talk about that the fourth quarter close of 2021, there were 4,814 projects representing nearly 582,000 rooms, which is down 8% by projects and 10% year over year by rooms. Yep. So we just have a lot of openings. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really the number one thing. Properties that are opening that have been delayed in the pipeline. Right. Of course, we've talked plenty about that, Glenn, where projects just didn't open when they anticipated they would, or they just pushed it off for financial reasons or supply chain issues or not looking to open into a downturn. So those openings are happening now, but then the starts that were gonna happen at the end of last year, we didn't see that as robust as anticipated and projects that are actively in the pipeline today are really kind of delaying their start, really just looking for more certainty on the financial stability of the return to lodging demand. All right, this is what I don't understand though, guys. Why not break ground now when we're in the, still in the middle of all of this? Because we see clearly, even though we all have glasses on, that by the time um, you put that first shelf on the ground, but by the time you welcome the first guest, it's going to be a completely different operating environment. So, Greg, what's going on? Why do people get so skittish? Why does this happen every single cycle? Well, I, and there's some other nuances, but this one's going to be a little bit different. I yeah. mean, supply chains are all fouled up still. We still have a ton of boats sitting out in the off the coastline here, going to the ports, right. being loaded. But part of the problem is right now, I'm seeing more people going to get dirt and doing the entitlement because of the pricing gap between already entitled dirt, where you can go in there and drop a shovel and start the project. So more land banking right now than anything else. I agree a, with that. Got a group down in uh, Orange County that mm -hmm. uh, has been on a tear, picking up uh, dirt throughout California. Um, now, I think also... I wish they'd do that more here in L.A., just uh, pick up some dirt. <laughs> but pro <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Product prices are through the roof, too. Yeah. Supply good. chain is not just necessarily about getting it here. It's about right. what does it cost to get it here. here. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, you know, COVID has affected a lot of manufacturing across the world. It's not just local here in the United States. So keeping the factories yeah. open and operating... Just like construction sites were suffering and still suffer some, you know, uh, pandemic woes, if you will. Mm -hmm. So price points for products is a big problem right now, as well as getting it here. And you've got Chinese New Year, so <clears throat> Lunar New Year. They're, yeah. they're all Chinese New right Year, now. Lunar New Year, coupled right. with Olympics, that's really going to slow China down for a little while. Yeah, so you've, it's kind of like a trifecta. They're still dealing with COVID, and they do massive lockdowns of certain cities from time to time. Then you got the uh, the Chinese New Year, where everybody basically stops working for weeks. And with the Olympics coming right on the heels of that, that's pretty tricky. I'm in a good year. Um, a Bruce, everybody tries to get their orders in what by the end of October, so stuff could get done before everything shuts down for yeah, a while. Yeah, usually, usually yeah. the order um, is early November. You got to have the orders in, so that you know the BDNY show, if you will, in early November is usually the last right. call, if you will. Yeah, um, but you know it's uh, all kinds of different challenges, Glenn. I think we had some. A very interesting conversation this morning, really about cost mm -hmm. and trying to be responsible because 
hotel investment is pretty attractive in the whole commercial mm -hmm. landscape right now because there are properties that are available at somewhat of a discount. So it, if you're a commercial real estate investor, you, you like hotels and you probably like it better than most other types of commercial real estate right now. But yet when you buy, you have to schedule that renovation so that it makes economic sense. It's not necessarily like hurry up and do it. Yeah. Um, but you want to be able to obviously retain the brand and retain that franchise agreement and get a logistics plan put together the way you're not going to uh, way overpay for product and services. I right. still think part of that's going to be you've got a lot of fresh money on the sidelines mm -hmm. coming into hospitality for the first time. So they're going to take a little bit longer to get deals. You know, they may do the acquisition, but, you know, it, they may be repositioning it with another brand and a few other things. Right. Closing. So that's going to take a little while. But you know, I, mean, I think the M&A thing that we're seeing is is huge effect as well. All right, but before we get into the M&A uh, thing, which is uh, an important thing to discuss because we're seeing a lot of action that's uh, happening or about to happen. But Colleen is asking, in, in, in to the last topic, is that we still having a container problem? Is it because people not working, trucks to haul it? I mean, from what I've seen, shipping costs have gone from like $2,000 a container to $20,000 a, a container, which is just one of a series of problems. Sure. And if you had the product already on order and now all of a sudden the shipping costs so much more, it totally changes your financial package, especially if yeah. you're taking in four or five containers from overseas. Right. It can be a couple hundred thousand right. dollars more you, money. You had told me a story about a designer that we both know out of Florida that had something like that happen, right? Bruce? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's over the top of, uh, yeah. and it's really just trying to get priority. OK, and I think that that's a lot of pricing that's happening right now. It's like, what, do you want it and do you want it right. in an expeditious manner? You can pay for priority position, um, which is basically means you'll, you're you're going to pay, you know, in some cases, you're gonna two, pay. Yeah, you're two gonna... and a half times what you might have paid in 2019. Jump the line. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you need to. Yeah. OK. And uh, VIP access. I like that. Uh, they're stealing. They're, are they stealing that from Live Nation? <laughs> <laughs> they could be. It's yeah. for, if it's for certain. So I think, you know, having a, a, a solid plan, a logistical plan that can work. So we're also seeing some uh, government implementation here, too, with trying to fight back some of this inflationary cost uh, hikes. In, uh, and I guess we're going to have a little interest rate bump. To right. Too. Um, oh, so uh, was it China that upped the price of a container? Is that really like companies like Maersk <laughs> that does that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, we talked about attendance at the uh, the event, and um, but what about the tenor of the event, of the people there? My feeling of it was uh, it seemed mostly like people were back to it, business as usual, but I didn't get either that feeling of cautious optimism or uh, there's great opportunity. It just kind of felt like, eh, it's another day. It's another year of COVID. We've, we've just got to get through. How did you guys see it, Craig? You know, yeah, I think you're right about that. It was wait and see. Yeah. Okay. We may have had a great year last year on the acquisition side. Now we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with these assets. Uh, but yeah, I didn't see anybody jumping for joy or being really cautious either. It was just like, okay, we're here. We're catching up with people. We've got a little right. bit of business to talk about. And let's move on. Craig, I was jumping for joy when you bought me that tequila last night. So. <laughs> <laughs> And now you're not moving after breakfast, so. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, he forced me to have some sort of loaded tater tots thing with bacon and eggs and all sorts of stuff on it. I'm barely functioning from that. That was good. <sighs> it was really good, but I'm feeling sluggish. Bruce? Uh, I found some people struggling a little bit with where prices were truly settling. I heard a lot of different input on in what context prices well it pricing on purchasing hotels right is it a 10 percent discount is it a 30 percent discount some people were saying in new york maybe as much as a 40 percent discount um you know and of course the difference between the open states and the closed states mm -hmm. about our hotels performing yeah um because there's less restriction less pandemic restriction so i think um, people were a little bit surprised at what some people would pay for certain hotels, both on the plus and the minus side. So uh, just lots of activity, but in some cases, taking time to 
bid on projects that really they ultimately didn't have a chance to win. Bruce, don't you think part of the strategy with that is, you know, what is our long-term goal? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be buy it, prove our performa, put it back out on the market, or are we going to hold it for 10 years, seven years? I think you have to have a minimum five-year hold right now if you're buying anything. I think you do too. I think a minimum five-year hold. So uh, yeah, that has an impact, but certainly the cost of money is reasonable. The availability of equity is more than reasonable. The availability of properties continues to go up. Uh, it's just a question of, are you in the business of buying $100 million, $300 million? Or are you trying to go one at a time? One at a time is very tough and, and, and somewhat inefficient right now, which is why we're seeing more mergers. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it, the mergers in particular and the management companies is going to be really interesting because one of the things we've seen over the last 15 years or so is a major proliferation of management companies. And and I probably at some point there was we were going to see mass consolidation anyway, because I think that's just how businesses ebb and flow to begin with. Right. But um, Bruce, how has the situation over the last two years maybe quickened? or slow down that particular M&A pace, do you think? Well, I think some management companies lost some pretty key assets that they were operating for financial institutions because the financial institutions at the beginning of the pandemic sought to consolidate the number of management companies they were working with. Right. So they might have bought hotels in the run up in the pandemic before the pandemic began. And as a result, they had 10 different management companies on 16 hotels. So they decided to pick two. And uh, so there was some loss there. So then they had to seek to pick up some of those hotels, pick some new assets back up, and some succeeded, some didn't. So if you're sitting there at six or seven hotels when you used to be 12 or 14, you got to look at some other alternatives. And I think that that's a lot of what we're seeing in the consolidation right now. Yeah, Craig? Yeah, I also think it's it's bandwidth with some of these companies. Right. You know, uh, right. You know the small cap management companies, you know, say 10 or less, and you've got your mid caps that have got, you know, 15 to 20, and then your larger companies, and, you know, Ambridge has been on a buying spree for the past few years. And I know, you know, three years ago, I was talking to some of the mid cap management companies. And I said, look, you know, you guys need to look now to you know, do some sort of consolidation. You barely came through the financial meltdown. Well, lo and behold, here we are in a pandemic and bandwidth with someone like Ambridge. You know, pure buying power, you know, makes them very attractive, especially to the corporate, uh, you know, owner. So, yeah, let's let's I think that's going to be a big trend for at least the next 12 to 20. So we're studying fees now. We're trying to figure out, you know, what are people actually charging if they're signing a new management contract these days? Um, Because there's some vast difference in that, too. Um, And 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 so owners are should always keep shopping if you will, don't just take the one bid that you think is the right person. For and performance-based, you know, mm-hmm. they hit certain milestones and, you know, they're, they're getting a bigger bite of the apple. So yeah, let's, let's look at what, what's the basic fee? What's this going to cost me up front? What's it going to cost me month to month? Let's see what your quarterly incentives are, your end of the year bonuses, a few other things. For some of these. Firms. So um, for, for folks that don't understand how management companies work, and of course, management companies operate hotels for the owners of that asset typically, but how does a fee structure typically work, guys? Well, again, it's going to depend. You know, select service is going to be an entirely different animal right. from full service. So, you know, you've got, you know, payroll, you've got mortgage, you've got utilities, everything that has to be covered, you know, then you're looking at, you know, other revenue that's coming in, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's some sort of leasing agreement with a ad for a restaurant up front or parking, and you've got to take all that money and pay all the bills, and then you've got to, you know, get the money to the owners. So if you're exceeding that and you're holding the cost down, then you can have a bonus program or an incentive program based on your performance. So instead of the old model used to be, we're going to charge this and that's going to be it. We're going to take right. ours right now. Right. And all of a sudden with the advent with more and more management companies, they had to get creative. So I think the more creation and the more you've got the ability to hold them accountable and get them to perform, right. make that performa happen, hold the cost down. You know, everybody wants more. They need, you know, 500 more sheets, you know, for the hotel. 
uh, for, you know, all the rooms. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a thousand showing up. You know, everybody's always ordering more. So you've got to control all that and be able to, you know, budget these fees, hold the on-site personnel accountable for everything. And that affects their bonuses at the end of the year as well. So right. I like performance-based. And I know when I was with, you know, whether it was 24-7 hotels or with Bronton hotels, you know, we had a lot of performance incentives to keep us going. We wanted to hit those milestones. We wanted that additional money. We also wanted to prove the performance to the owners. And they were holding us accountable. So were the asset managers. You know, so make sure the hotel doesn't physically take a right. meeting. So. Right. Yeah. Brucey? Well, you know, performance metrics have changed so much during the pandemic. And how fast are you going to recover? Um, management companies also bring, you know, the, the staff with them in many cases. So, so, you know, having an experienced general manager who may not have experience at that property, but have experience in other places, you know, makes a difference. Good sales and marketing people. Yeah. But also trying to figure out what demand is available in those given markets is also uh, one of the big challenges. So I think I see a lot more flat fee stuff advertised for the beginning period now. We'll take a flat fee for six months and then reevaluate. I think that there's some takers at that level right now that uh, that we continue to see. But um, meetings is still what we need. Meetings and conventions and conferences at hotels is still what we need. That's the place in the portion of demand that's still the most largely affected. And, um, but the hotels right. that have been able to flex to be able to take more leisure and take more leisure at a higher rate. And uh, those, those are the hotels that are doing the best right now. Right. So if you look at that group business and obviously I, I think it's an interesting uh, parallel because we're here at the Alice conference. And while I felt it was still a successful conference for the people that were attending, it was definitely down in numbers from 2020, January of 2020, or just before COVID. I think they had over 3,000 people at, right. at that one. So if you think about it, it's still a very well done, successful event for the attendees. But with so many fewer people, that's uh, hundreds and hundreds of hotel rooms that weren't taken. You know, tens of thousands of dollars not spent on businesses around the neighborhood. So it really has a, a negative effect for every single person that doesn't show up at these things. I mean, look at CES. I think they only had something like 35,000 instead of over 100,000 show up this year. Right, Craig? Well, I think that's you got to ask yourself this question. Does this model work? You know, has the industry evolved? Mm -hmm. Is the multi-day, three-and-a-half, four-day conference really work? anymore right you know? we've been talking about that over the last uh 36 hours yeah, corporate shop. guys take a half day to travel and a day and a half that's what you got yeah. you get two two whole days and uh if they have to go from coast to coast right that continues to contract a little bit um that's just where the corporate guys are at that's all the time they have to give you and but they will <laughs> they will push dollars at it no question yeah. about it and right. i think we saw the corporate spend kind of return a little bit but still, uh, you know, if 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 uh, Marriott had 38 people here in 2019, they probably had 24 right. here this time. Yeah, for, for, uh, for sure. And you're right about it there. It was good corporate spend. And tune in tonight at Friday Night Audit where maybe I will tell you about my theory of how the quality of sushi served at industry parties directly correlates to the health and safety of our industry overall. But you're going to have to tune in tonight at 8 p.m. East Coast time. 5 p.m. Pacific. But yeah, Bruce, you're right. The, but the, the, the corporate guys coming in and out, and by guys, I mean men and women. I'm just saying uh, people, corporate people coming in and out. Um, that's a, a phenomenon that's been happening for years and kind of building, building, building. I don't think um, COVID created that situation, right? But traditionally, industry conferences are everybody comes in like the night before, and then you have the one day, the second day, and they usually have a third day just to try to get people to stick around for that second day. But that strategy isn't working any longer. That's why I think we're going to see a lot more single day events that like you've been pioneering, Craig, Tom, like five years ago. Yeah. I, and again, that was it. it was, yeah. I think you got to be conscious of everybody's time. Yeah. And, you know, my, my event is solely focused on California. Okay. So Bruce is our opening keynote. He released a report earlier this week about LA construction being number one in the nation for hospitality. Right. So this is everything we've got. You can drive, ride a bicycle, fly in yep. and be back in the office the next day executing, you know, your, 
your internal meetings to, with all the great information you're coming away with with that one day event. And of course, that's March 10th. Go to cliconference.com to learn more. Bruce? So fair to say that you may have better success in a three-day environment if you are at a five-star resort versus a downtown urban center right. location. Right. So the difference between those is when you're at a downtown urban uh, location, everybody comes to the event, but then they scatter. And when you come to an event such as an Alice or an NYU or some of the other major events, um, all of the major brands or vendors will have parties off site. And we do a lot of cocktail party hopping. But if you are smart, and that's why what like what the lodging conference does yeah. is they have it at a resort and, and they have rooms for a lot of the people, not everybody, but a lot of the people. And it really keeps people contained. I think it makes those kind of events are a lot more intimate and you have a lot more opportunities to have meaningful connections with people because less people are sneaking out to parties and going to dinners. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think, you know, even the, the final few years at uh, the Arizona Biltmore with the Logic Conference, right. I didn't leave the campus. OK, it was no, I'm staying here. I really didn't like when people would ask me to leave campus and it would be like, uh, you know, hey, come on over to this thing. That's a half an hour drive. We'll give you the bus. But then you're never going to really be able to get back when you want to get back. And exactly. it crushes your time from going to those cocktail parties, which I think are just quintessentially important. Yeah. yeah. And what they've done at, at the Logic Conference, everything is self-contained. They're at a resort that's, mm -hmm. you know, 20 minutes away from everything. Everybody has got their parties there. And you can hop, you can still see everybody and go to the main event or the conference that night as well. But all of us being small business guys, we're not acting like corporate people. So here we are on day three and we're still here. Right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and there's plenty of things for each of us to do. We all have unique schedules today in terms yeah. of what we're going to do in Los Angeles. And, you know, from our years of experience, the Wednesday is still a, a, a good day for us here. Sunday wasn't. Because uh, we flew out on Sunday, so the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I actually like the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday a little bit better. I think you got a better chance of getting the three people, three days of some people versus the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which everybody's on the jet Friday morning and out of here. Yeah. Not me. I'm driving. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Show off. Uh, yeah. I'm flying home to uh, tomorrow and I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that. But do not worry, everybody. Uh, Anthony and I have a show tomorrow. It's pre recorded. We recorded it yesterday. We're going to be focusing on hospitality, technology, consolidation, and all the things you out there need to be considering when it comes to hotel tech. Um, Daniel is asking Bruce, what's trending these days? Uh, what's trending? Well, definitely transactions. First, uh, the last six months of 2021. I thought you were going to say hashtag Brady retirement. Uh, <laughs> no, Ortiz in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> we're on to baseball, kids. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, congratulations to Big Poppy. Uh, but uh, sales transactions the last six months of last year was probably the most active we've seen since pre-08. Um, with that being said, we expect it to continue, and we have seen the results of that in kind of the first month of this year. Also, what's trending is collection brands. So everybody is, uh, everybody being the franchise companies have created these collection brands, which are, some people would say, soft brands or, you know, come into our reservation system, but you don't need to be the, the gray and Hilton look or the red and gold Marriott look. You can have uh, a more organic look to the location of the property. And those are very popular today. And many of the major franchise companies have quite a few selections really from kind of, in some cases, a boutique, upper mid-scale, upscale, all the way up to a luxury uh, offering right. in there. And many of the buyers of these hotels are seeing those as a great opportunity because it may have less renovation commitment to it. Also, uh, collection brands. I really think about all the brands collecting all these other uh, <laughs> brands out there and getting dozens of them under one roof. Hey, Glenn, how yes. about lifestyle brands? That's your favorite. No, yeah, don't get me started, <laughs> dude. All right, tune in tonight, 8 p.m. to Friday Night Audit, and I will uh, I will complain about uh, complain about that very issue if you'd like. We haven't had enough uh, hashtag Grumpy Glenn going on. I've been uh, I've been in too good of a mood lately exactly. except for my winter time, blues yeah. issues but that didn't make me comfy that just made me a uh, sad sad yeah. plan you know sad. uh which means this <laughs> he's gonna use a whole year of sound effects thank goodness he's not uh here today <laughs> 8 p.m east coast time 5 p.m pacific time otherwise known as uh 7 p.m texas time 
All right. So um, a lot going on here, a lot to digest over here. Um, one of the uh, interesting things that I'm seeing is, you know, we've been following the Sinesta story for a couple of years o- over here already. Since the uh, pandemic started, that company has uh, taken advantage of a lot of opportunity and is uh, completely uh, transforming. And it looks like a couple of years from now, once they put all their plans into place, guys, um, they're going to be a real force to be reckoned with. Uniquely, uniquely different because they have today, uh, at least on the Sinesta side, one of their, uh, they have a primary owner that has a couple hundred locations uh, that they've been able to diversify the Sinesta brand into about five different offerings mm-hmm. now, in addition to the other brands that they have. But now kicking off with some franchising, um, they're hoping to to really take their is it eight or nine brands, Glenn? I can't remember. I think it's either eight or nine. Yeah. But they're hoping to take their collection and really kind of have that offering from the upper upscale level all the way down to the economy level, you know, which is a strong start. And uh, working on new plans for those as they're uh, working with the Sinesta family. But they are off to a strong kickoff. Mm-hmm. And I think the renovation plans that they have for the existing mm-hmm. real estate that they have is a is a very good start and uh you know would be interested to see how the comparison again of the franchise fees they're going to be charging versus some of the other major players in the right. industry i'm not sure how much insight you got on that yet glenn or Craig, no. but i didn't get much but they did uh they did roll out their franchising plan that they yep. were doing that at the lodging conference in september so they've been at it now for a couple of months and by the way it's seven seven brands is the okay. other winning number Seven, and they also signed up while we we're here at at Alice. They're now a sponsor and a speaker at the California Lodging Investment Conference. So you get to meet the franchise team there as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Bruce, you, you look like you're going to say something. Yeah, and and I think at the Sinesta level, you know, conversions are going to be very active in the industry, and really the conversion is an existing piece of real estate that's going to change its brand. Of course, Service Properties Trust is very involved with Sinesta. And they are the primary franchisee and they have uh, a number of assets where um, some of them are for sale. They've been talking about uh, transacting some of those hotels then taking back the franchise agreements on some of those hotels. So very active there today. I think, the you know, Sinesta offers a unique advantage, obviously, because it's new and they can put a new plan together to be competitive out there in the marketplace. And I think we expect them right. to compete uh aggressively for um those new conversion opportunities so i i think we will see that but also uh out there in the industry you know hyatt's a very interesting story right now glenn too with the consolidation they've gone through over the past uh 12 to 18 months they have quite a few brands that most people don't necessarily recognize that they control today and they've really built out their um the alia the um the destination uh, as well as the uh, Zwadavir, mm-hmm. uh, you know, portfolio as they start to really go through a, a pretty aggressive redevelopment plan for many of those hotels too. Yeah, they, they've got a, they got a lot of friends, and they're one of the companies that they just have been quietly, increasingly successful over the last 10, 12 years. Ever since uh, Mark Hoplamazian took over that company, it's really, it's been really an incredible ride to watch. Uh, some of the other brands that they have, uh, Miraval, you probably didn't realize that they had, um, Thompson Hotels, for example. So they've really put, put together a very nice collection in, a, in what they call the timeless they, portfolio, the and, boundless portfolio, and the collections. And they portfolio. won two awards yesterday at the Alice Deal of the Year. They mm-hmm. won for their uh acquisition of apple leisure group and mm-hmm. they also won for the select service development of the year too so um congratulations to hyatt yeah absolutely so who else won those awards bruce and i know that uh your company has a, a role in that yeah we do we chair the committee for the alice development of the year so the winner in the full service yesterday was the uh hilton tri brand at yeah. the resorts world uh, project in Las Vegas, which of course is uh, was a kind of a, a project that's been coming along for quite a long time. But they have three different Hilton right. brands in there, including mm-hmm. a Conrad, the largest Conrad in the world. Oh, yeah, I haven't heard of this project. Resorts? What? <laughs> <laughs> Galaxy. How many days did you broadcast from there? <laughs> I know. I've stayed there. I've stayed there several times. Uh, 
already. Absolutely great resort. 3,500 rooms under the three different brands. You're right about that largest Conrad. I think 1,200 rooms, and I think the Hilton is 1,500 rooms. And uh, So it's on and off again. In yeah. Las Vegas on the Strip, it was, a, it was really on in the 90s and the early 2000s for all of the major franchise companies right. to have a branded location. So, you know, IHG was connected with the Venetian Palazzo for many, many years. Uh, and, of course, Marriott was connected with the Cosmopolitan for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and that's now kind of back on as this uh, this Hilton location for Resorts World is, uh, is kind of the newest, biggest, brightest thing. And if you guys want to learn more about Resorts World, I've got an incredible interview coming out on Friday under the Hotel Design Podcast banner. Featuring Paul Steelman. He, of course, runs Steelman Partners. They designed that building as well as many of the most famous casino resorts around the world. So we go into the story about how they took a partially built structure that was originally started by Boeing Gaming, was supposed to be Project Echelon, and transformed that into what you see today. So uh, check that out coming out on Friday. And if you subscribe to our newsletter by texting the word HOTEL to 66866, you'll get in your mailbox on Sunday. So Las Vegas is a great study, Glenn, right now of kind of how demand has changed. Las Vegas is really trying to stretch out their leisure demand, which is typical weekend travelers. But we heard some unique statistics here at the conference about leisure and its conversion to leisure. Now, Do you I have a uh, vomit button over you, here? You right? patented <laughs> that word, didn't you, Glenn? Uh, uh, no, I believe I actually believe it was my uh, my colleague, Sean Worker, because okay. um, before we started doing any work together, going back eight, nine, ten years ago, they put out uh, a leisure report, and I had never ever heard about that at the time. And that's actually was the catalyst for me to get to know him. So um, credit goes to him and score too, if you'd like. But <laughs> – Part of the part of the leisure aspect that's coming back now is that still many people are still working remotely. And if you're uh, you're remote and your wife is working remote and your kids are perhaps able to do remote school or you're doing homeschooling, you know, the two days you might have spent at a hotel for, you know, just a weekend getaway might be four days now because you can work a couple days in the hotel right. or at least one day in the hotel and get some extra time. And of course, the hotels are very interested in it having you, particularly the resorts. And that is a higher rate, typically, than even a business traveler guest might pay. And you're more likely to work with more services at the hotel if there's a spa mm -hmm. or multiple restaurants. You're, you're more inclined to do, or golf, you're more inclined to do that too. So really an expansion of that uh, marketplace. And it led us to kind of talk a little bit about what might have been a traditional weekend of Friday and Saturday night is now right. Thursday to Monday. Yeah. You know, yep. and, and how that's changing. And a little bit about leisure demand also and kind of where it's, you know, thriving, if you will, those outside destinations, the beachfront resorts, certainly the places that are a little bit more open and less restrictive. But also, um, you know, Las Vegas still doesn't have the group demand, still doesn't have the convention demand. And there's still, you know, rooms that are closed down in some of yeah. these big buildings just simply because the occupancy isn't there three or four days a week. But um, you've been on the ground a couple times in Las Vegas, Glenn, uh, since the pandemic began. Um, the last time you went, I think was... I was four times there last year. I was there the first week of December, most Did recently. you find it to be progressively better each time in terms of people that you saw or still... It'd be of... really hard to beat what I saw when I was first there in 2021. I was there a couple of times in 2020 after the pandemic started. But in June of 2021, we were kind of like feeling like it was all over. And Vegas was just chock-a-block with excitement and people with crowds that I hadn't seen, seen, seen in forever. But this fall, I went there three times. And each time, it got a little progressively not as enthusiastic. And a lot of it had to come down to um, the mask mandates and stuff. It felt a little bit softer, not as exciting. But I in Vegas, everybody respects the mask mandates for about 20 minutes or two drinks. And then, then that's about it. for They're the, actively uh, eating and drinking, right? Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, that's right. they are. All right. So Kyle's got a great question over here, guys. So um, smaller hotel operators in New York are laying people off again, probably in cities like L.A., Chicago as well. Yet these people are having no issue finding new jobs. I mean, unemployment's at record lows, right? Um, are smaller operators going to get hit harder 
now in the new normal. Who wants to tag, take that one? That's wow. a tough one. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you guys. But I, I, I would, uh, I would say that I'm not surprised by that. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of that has got to do with people's long-term employment agreements that they have with some of these hotels. Mm -hmm. I just don't think people want to work in a hotel for under 20 bucks an hour right now. Uh, it's, it's too much of a strain and there's too many other options and opportunities. And, uh, in some cases, the hotel operators have to make a choice because as we said, it's probably still going to be six more months to re to begin the recovery. And maybe that's kind of a, a little bit of a short term view on right. it, but I guess I'm, I'm not really surprised to hear his observation. Uh, no, not at all. I'm going to bring up a, a photograph on my phone here right now, guys, because uh, I did, I know this is going to shock you, Bruce, but I did go to the, uh, the general session, the opening general session. Right. <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> the good uh, the good folks from that statistics company put out uh, put out some information on how they see it going. Now, the thing that really I just want to let everybody know that the thing frustrates me is um, number one, everything is um, everything is average numbers. So you're having the haves and the have nots right. put together to create a, uh, a a situation of numbers that doesn't exist, and then um, oh god, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to go to my pictures, and then combine that with the fact that a lot of these companies continually change what they're going to be, what their numbers are going to be. So they, they kind of are taking a best guess now, but they don't really know. But that being said, um, occupancy in 2021 was 57.6%. Now they're saying this year it'll be 63.8, going up to 66.1 and winding up with just under 70, uh, 67% in 2024. But when you're looking at RevPAR, uh, it's, we're looking at uh, 72 last year, 86 this year, 92 next year, and 97 in 2024, which is a 12% increase over a 7% increase. So uh, if those numbers hold true, pretty good. But I really don't know how you look ahead two years into the future when we're in a universe of uncertainty, Craig. Well, yeah, I, I agree with, with both of you guys. Now, also part of it's going to be location. Right. Okay. Oh, and, and that's the whole thing. Because yeah. some of these hotels out here on the coast are doing phenomenal. Right. But I was looking at a hotel in Minneapolis downtown next week, and I could have stayed at a luxury hotel for a hundred and change a night. Yeah. And use all the sky bridges to get around and that's see right. everything that's closed. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> uh, but now okay, let's let's take a look at the ownership group for the Wayfair. Pacifica Hotels, fifty year old family owned yep. hotel owner, operator, management group, development company. Okay. Right. They've got 12 plus hotels up in the central coast of California. Right. And they've been running 90% occupancy throughout the entire pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, good for them. And everybody's always saying to them, you know, well, wait till summer's over, wait till it's, you know, and it's like, no, it's going to continue because there are wide open spaces. Yeah. I, I think, you know, if you go to Terranea, one of, our favorite here in, in Los Angeles, yep. you have plenty of room, you know, you can, you can stay there and do whatever you want. You can use all the amenities, have that leisure trip and go. Also getting back to that pleasure trip, you've got resorts like Terran and various other ones that also have kids camps. So, you know, there's more for the family to do. You need a few hours to work. Spouse goes to the spa or the pool. Kids are in the camp. You're able to get your stuff done and right. you know, really enjoy the trip get and make it happen all right I'll now i do think that yeah you know getting back to the employment thing you know i think we're on the verge of a shift and it's not it's going to be far more than just 20 dollars an hour okay we're open 365 we've got people working every holiday so i think the benefits package also has to be improved a few extra pto days you know added into that that package now I'm, I, I don't think that your insurance should be tied to your employment, okay? And I'll get a ton of blowback on right. that. Uh, but I think there's ways of bonuses and salary structures and other things you can do to improve the scenario. But really, the bottom line has been for decades. Uh, we've done a horrible job of promoting hospitality as an industry and a career. And I think producer Suzanne could probably speak to you know, some of the issues of enrollment right now. 
we've we've got to get off the dime and make this an attractive industry for a career. And until right. we do that, a lot of our problems aren't going to go. Away. That's an issue we've been talking about for a while. And no. just so, uh, just uh, hey, Phil, hi, we are live. I know that you just uh, texted me. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to answer Christopher's question in just one second. So hang out. But Bruce, do you want to comment on anything that Craig just said? Uh, no, I honestly, I think we've we've worked the topic pretty much. I, I you know, the hotel industry has. Uh, I think I saw 167,000 jobs have left the hotel industry since the beginning yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah, and so, that's on top of the million jobs that were open prior. Correct. Uh, correct. Right. And so, you know, there's a long way to come back. And those jobs that are coming back, people that are coming back, it's going to be at a different salary structure than when they left. So. Yeah. And uh, food and beverage is still, of course, a very big portion of what has been left. And we saw some people talking about some ho some full service hotels choosing to discontinue room service versus others that continued it. And there was one of the gentlemen from the European statistics company that said that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, room service was up 80 percent in the Middle East. Not the case here. Right. OK. And uh, that's just a result of staffing. But room service has never been a money maker here in America because we don't know how to do it efficiently. <laughs> it's never That's a whole other conversation. Right. Yeah. We don't want to talk about that right now. Do we have an hour for that? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I, I, I wish, and I would, I would do a super long show with you guys if I didn't have to go do that uh, keynote lunch speech today at 1.30 at a, at a conference in Beverly Hills, International Hospitality Design Show. All right. So Christopher is asking, Bruce, you referenced the renovation pipeline. Uh, could the panel please comment on the overall fitness of the renovation and new build pipeline in general terms? So we're still going to have three to three and a half times more rooms renovated this year than will open new. So that's about 95,000 new rooms this year and probably somewhere in the area of 350, 350,000 for renovation and conversion rooms. The health of that has really got to do with the product pricing that we're seeing on the market right now. Supply chain is slowly working itself out, but are the, and we like to say, are the buyers and sellers going to come together? That's really a theme across a lot of different types of hotel industry discussions today, both on the transacting of a hotel, both on the product specification side between the designer, the product company, and the, the buyer of the product. So. Uh, will the buyers and sellers come together will determine the true health of the renovation and conversion pipeline. But there is a lot of pent up demand for renovation going forward. And we expect the next two years to be very healthy for renovation. It should be, but designers are going to have to be more clever. We were talking to a uh, principal of one of the most major design firms in the, in the country this morning mm -hmm. Who is saying that they're actively rethinking all the types of products and stuff that they're they're buying because the pricing is crazy? And we were speaking to uh, another uh, par uh, a, a partner in a major hotel uh, uh, company out west who was saying the same thing that they're just not going to be paying for certain items, right? Yeah. So how do you think this is going to affect design and those renovations? Well, in the what future? did I say to you, Craig, across the table this morning? Right. I said, you know what? Sometimes choosing that cheap product get you a cheap life cycle of the product, right. which it doesn't turn out to be the right. best move. Right. Um, so also, I just want to tell people I'm not chugging milk. This is actually a uh, boxed water. That would be really, really gross to chug milk. Uh, yes, boxed water is better. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, Bruce. It's, you know, you get what you pay for. And during that conversation, I also mentioned, you know, we got to stop cutting right. You know, it, every time there's somebody sneezes, you know, it, it seems like they're dropping rates. You got to stop that. You got to hold the rates. Yeah. You've got to get people back in there. You've got to do your renovation. You've got to do your PIP. Okay. Now, is there going to be a little bit more negotiation with the brand and getting that PIP? Done? Sure, there is. But it's also going to depend on the property. Okay. I think you're, you know, the, these big fat full service boxes attached to convention centers especially here in California, New York, Chicago, all the major markets have suffered. So right. do they almost issue more of a mini pip instead of a full-blown one on those? Mini pip, days? great rapper name, by the way. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well it, that's our entertainment tonight, yeah. right? Uh, uh, <laughs> mini pip. But, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be, you know, a few things have changed. Yeah. And, you know, you know, what was a Hilton today is going to be something else tomorrow. 
Um, you know, a, let Bruce and I talk to the franchise development teams right. every week, every day of the week. And, you know, they're still, they're looking at things that are going to be conversions. Everybody knows they're going to lose some flags and everybody's trying to plant a new one on, on a hook. Right. But the smart companies have already set it up. So they've got all these different brands in different tiers. Exactly. You so that allows you to either move the them tier. or right. to go and pilch someone else who wants to uh, move either up or down the chain scale that they happen to be on. Right. Um, uh, Craig, Michelle's got a question for you. Are most lenders at a 10 click? Uh, which is, of course, March 10th at the crown jewel of the Anaheim Resort, JW Marriott. Uh, are they also national and global? Yes. Uh, one of them is our, our friends at Stonehill, and they are national. They are doing a little bit of international work as well. We do have uh, local lenders, community banks, national lending, and we're bringing together about a half dozen lenders that have been making loans throughout the pandemic. Um, some of our relationship banks that uh, are involved have in, you know, just been I definitely work. saw an uptick in banks and lending institutions that were here at this yep. conference that were actively looking to place capital yep. and equity and debt uh, and mezzanine financing, too. So I, I, I felt that that was a strong indicator uh, that maybe wasn't here in July that is definitely here now. Another right. strong indicator on that is the C-Pace loan. Yep. Instead of mess debt, I mean, it's substantially less interest rate, you know, two payments a year tied to your tax bill where C-based loans are, are allowed. So um, yeah, there's some great lending opportunities out there right now. So, you know. Well, in, in, in fact, uh, that market seems to be doing so well. The uh, current president of AHOA, Ken Green, is leaving the organization to go to a company uh with a multi-billion dollar uh, with multi-billion dollars to deploy out in the in the market, so that sounds like a fun job. Being able to spend money on hotels, right? Yeah, I want to deploy <laughs> billions of dollars on hotels. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Anyone else got anything on that particular topic? No. Nope. Yep. Done. All right. Yeah, so Kyle's also asking you. You're in the in the, the meetings biz. Do you feel people are looking to change brands? Uh, Yes, people are always looking to change brands. I think that's just part of the natural cycle of uh, everything. But do you guys feel like it's going to be an inordinate amount in the next couple of years? Or will it just be more of the traditional percentage? You know, that, that's a great question. And I, and I think it's going to be more than what we've typically seen. But a couple of things that you got to keep in mind is you cannot invalidate your loan covenants. Now, the lender made you that loan based on that brand. Mm -hmm. So if you're staying, let's say, within the Marriott family, probably going to not get as scrutinized as much as if you were jumping right. to somebody else. Um, so you've got to be careful of that. You've got to look at it. You know, I, again, you know, we cut rates at the drop of a hat. We do a lot of things that we probably shouldn't do. And, we, you know, seem to learn that lesson for a minute and a half. And then we start repeating it again. Uh but I think you're going to see a lot of brand conversions. I, you know, you've also got groups out there that have been pretty much independent, take five, six of their hotels and put them into a soft brand. And they've found tremendous benefit with that. Uh, so, you know, are you going to see, I think you're going to see a lot of the boutique operators going to some of the soft brands. Right. I think that's, that's going to be a true growth market for, you know, the Marriott's, the Hilton's and everybody else out there. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's about 800, 800 projects a year are converting right now. And that's running about 10 percent above the long term sure. average. So I am not think we're going to see a doubling and a tripling of that. No. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if at peak year for conversions, we approached a thousand conversions in the U.S. in a given year coming up. Wow. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. Guys, we're getting close to an hour. How about some uh, final thoughts, observations, and anything else that you, you want, Craig? You know, it's it's great seeing everybody out here. It's great, you know, the three of us being together. You know, it, unfortunately, the pandemic screwed a lot of that up for not just us, but everybody else. But I think, you know, guarded optimism. We're on we're getting ready to start that next chapter. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we're, we're, we're close. I think we're going to have a, I think transactions wise across the country, we're going to have a very good year. I think California, we're going to have a very good year for that. And we'll go more into depth on that 
on Click Connect. I start filming those shows again next month. And then, of course, the California Lodging Investment Conference. And then we can, you know, complain about things on Friday night on it. Yeah, so, which is uh, coincidentally tonight right. at 8 p.m. Eastern Five Time. Pacific. There you go. Make sure you check that out. Very special show. We got uh, us three plus Sarah Dandishi, producer Dave, and maybe even producer Sam coming on to make an appearance. Yeah, she's going to be there. She's smiling. This is awesome. Should be a real fun one. Bruce, what do you got to share? So we're paying attention a lot to the timeline changes at particular projects that have entered the pipeline mm -hmm. and how long it takes them to actually get open. So we're continuing to monitor that at LE. I think I've said to a few of you, if I saw you this week or if we were together at all over the past month, really the timeline for projects to open has continued to uh, be pushed out a little bit. Some of that supply chain, some of that is material costs, some of that is construction, health and safety protocol stuff. So it is a lot of a combination of, of, of more than a few things. I continue to believe in the health and strength of the industry, and I continue to believe that if you are a product or service provider, there is plenty of work out there to do. The people who are going to choose your services are different than they were before. But I also firmly believe that the industry is going to take a little bit of time, a couple of years, before we will truly feel recovery from what we have gone through in the past two years. So a slow and steady ride up the curve as we uh, head towards recovery. But you can catch me on Twitter, B-F-I-N-N-H. Lodging Econometrics has closed our year-end database, and we will be publishing quite a few nuggets. So visit lodgingeconometrics.com to get onto those press release um, programs. And of course, if I can be of assistance, you can always catch me at Bruce at lodgingeconometrics.com. Beautiful. Well, thank you all for being here. We had a great time. Now, tomorrow we got a pre-recorded show with uh, Tim Sullivan, the CEO of Sendine. They just completed the, uh, uh, the closing of the acquisition merger, I should say, of uh, Pegasus. But we use that as a, a kicking off point to talk about all of technology in the hospitality industry and what you really need to be thinking about as we move forward. And of course, be sure you download the audio version of our podcast. You find that on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. Look, wherever you want to download your shows, we are there for you. We're all about making things easy for you. Although uh, I do like to make it tough on Anthony from uh, time to time. But he's not here and can't defend himself, so I'm not going to continue with that. But anyway, if you want to reach out to him, he's at Anthony Hotels. I'm at Traveling Glenn. Guys, it's been awesome seeing you here today. Great seeing you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us, Glenn. Yes. Remember, guys, remember you've got one life, so blaze on. and. Be kind to yourself. See you next. Well, see you tomorrow, but also next week and every week Tonight. after that. Ad nauseum. I'm two years into this. 570 plus shows. We're not going anywhere. Thanks for watching. See you later.